These days, food is news. We go to the story. This war has to end. Bring it back to our kitchen. Today, we are making a coffee date cake. We dig into the issues. Maybe 20 people have touched your coffee from farm to cup. And serve it up. We call it the hood slip. <laughs> I'm Sophia Rowe, and this is Counter Space. The U.S. is the world's second biggest importer of coffee. It is a very labor-intensive crop. It can take three to four years for a plant to bear the kind of fruit we would roast and grind. But the two people typically paid the least in the chain are the farmer and the barista. Learning about coffee is about learning where your dollar goes. We follow one of those chains from Michigan to Yemen. Hello. Hey, how are you? What do you recommend today? You want something with cream or no cream? Yeah, a little cream, a little something. Uh, go with them forward. So everything for here, right? Yes, sir. Ibrahim Al Hasabani is a coffee mogul in the making. In 2017, he opened his first shop in Dearborn and is now branching out to two locations, one across town and another in New York. He's not selling your average American style filtered coffee though. But Hasabani's coffee beans are from Yemen. Enjoy guys. Thank you. We're gonna make one Sanani and one Jubani. Okay. For Sanani, we're gonna use a medium roast with a cardamom. For the Jubani, we use light roast, medium roast, coffee husk, ginger, cinnamon, cardamom. Got so it. So it's like special mix. So this is like the gateway drug into Yemen? Yes. It's like bridge. It doesn't have sugar. But Yemeni coffee is famous. It has natural sweetness in it. And I take my coffee with sugar every morning, but I can drink this without sugar. Good. That's so good. you're going to change your mind now. These coffee beans are sweeter because they're grown in the highest mountainous regions of the country. Why is coffee so important for Yemen? For Yemen, first, it's our culture. We drink coffee every day. It's also uh, open. Yemen to the other countries. So when they start shipping to the different countries, people, they, 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 uh, they read more about Yemen. They, they want to visit Yemen. They want to see what's different about Yemen. How old were you when you had your first cup of coffee? So my mom, she told me when I was a kid, I had two things, coffee and a spicy. She said, if there is something wrong with this baby. <laughs> yeah. Yemen may have been the first to drink coffee nearly a thousand years ago when it exported it out of a famous port called Mocha. But colonialism, conflict, and the rising popularity of coffee crops elsewhere overtook it. Al Hasabani left home in 2011, but his brother's still back in Haraz, running the family's coffee farm. Hello. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Kaif halak? Alhamdulillah. Kaif alak? Aywa, wash al akbar? Wallah, kulli shi tamam al bunni tamam, wallah. Ya, utakadu ma shirgu, illa yani, yani, wabakt al kafi, wabakt al munasib. For five years, a rebel militia based in the north, the Houthis, has been fighting with a coalition. Backed by the Saudis for control, the coalition blocked most imports from coming in, and the fighting has made life in the region's poorest country hell. More than 100,000 people have died so far from airstrikes, famine, and rampant disease. And exporting anything amid all of this chaos is sometimes impossible. 
it's cheaper to attempt this only once a year. And the only way to keep the beans fresh is to roast and grind them in the U.S. You must really believe in this Yemeni coffee. Yes. First, I believe in our brand. I believe in our Yemeni coffee beans is one of the best coffee beans in the world. Uh, also, I believe in myself. I didn't listen to anyone. I just uh, I spent all saving I have for 1K. I broke it down. I just I use it. I use all my credit card. I use all the money I have. So everybody, you're crazy. When people first hear the word Yemen, they think of the current war, bloodshed. But to you, Yemen signifies something else. It's not my life. It's my birthplace. I, I stop watching the news, actually, especially when it comes to Yemen. It's, it's just sad. I'm far right here, and I can't do nothing. It's just, uh, I can't control my emotion. I can't control myself. It's bothering me from inside. All my family is still there. I have my sister, she was sick. And because there is no hospital in Yemen, there is no doctors, there is no medicine, she passed away in the way. And because they took her to the hospital and they said there is, they didn't do nothing for her. So they send her back home and she get worse. They take her back to the hospital, she didn't make it. Do you ever feel guilty that you're here and they're there back in a war zone? Sometimes I feel guilty because I'm not next to them. Family is very important. Other side, when I feel not guilty because at least I'm here to support them, to help them. If all of us stuck there, you don't know what's gonna happen. What are your hopes for a better Yemen? This war has to end. This is first. Second, we have to be all Yemeni together. Uh, What are you thinking about? I just want to get emotional, that's why I'm not. <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, always crazy about me. When I remember those people, it's not. When they fight, it's not just, uh, it's really bad. Okay, if we're not, not going to do nothing, nothing going to change. Yemeni farmers are actually credited with originally cultivating coffee. Listen, that's heavily debated, but today we are making a coffee date cake. How can this not be the most scrumptious thing you've ever tasted? We're gonna get right into it. We've got water, we're gonna do a little press situation, we also have some baking soda, dates of course. We're also gonna be using a scale today, now hear me out. Baking is science, science is exact. Measuring cups, they measure volume. They don't measure density. This is why a scale is so important. So we are going to first thing, make some coffee. So I'm gonna pour this in. There are a lot of uses for coffee. You see coffee used in so many different ways in so many different cultures. You see it in the South a lot for rubs. You also see coffee used in moles, different sauces. So we're gonna get this coffee going. And then we're gonna come in with our baking soda. The baking soda helps make things fluffy. We're gonna take the baking soda right over our dates. It's gonna help break down the, the fibers of these dates. All right, we've got our scale here. Mine's already set to grams, because you know. We've got our dates, okay? Put that on. It's gonna give you a weight. You're gonna press either a zero button or a tear button. On this scale, it's the tear button. And then we are gonna pour this coffee right over until it hits 400. You wanna make sure you let the dates soak for about 10 minutes in the hot coffee. It's gonna help break those dates down as well. We also wanna make sure that our dates are completely submerged. No pits inside your dates. We're gonna blend these. 398, oh, oh, oh. Hey, 403. This is for our glaze at the end. We're gonna let this hang out for 10 minutes, and then we're gonna get the rest of our ingredients ready to finish our fabulous, fabulous coffee day cakes. Check out our coffee date mixture. I mean, this just blends up, and now you've got this delicious, unctuous, just date coffee liquid that you can rub all over your body if you want. Or not, I mean, we're gonna make a cake with it. So we've got the rest of our ingredients. 
we've got butter, brown sugar. If you don't have a hand mixer, you can use the back of a wooden spoon. We're gonna crack two eggs right in. This is the texture we're looking for. We want it to almost look like icing. Now we're gonna go in for the date board. Remember, this is coffee and dates. It's a sweet treat that'll give you a kick. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We're just gonna fold this in. Look at that. Now, it's gonna look a little separated. Don't worry, don't stress. That is perfectly normal. All right, got rice flour, almond flour, and buckwheat flour. It's intrinsically gluten-free, which I think is great. So we're just gonna put these in. We're also gonna hit this with a heavy pinch of salt. Sweet things love a good pinch of salt. It's delicious. So I'm gonna come in here. This has been sprayed to the gods, okay? Because if you don't spray it, it'll stick. We're not trying to have our cake stick. We're gonna do even scoops in each one. The one thing you should know is that this cake will puff up a little bit. Just keep that in mind. Fill it almost to the top. So we're gonna just set this aside. We're gonna, we're gonna throw it in 350 for 15 minutes. And then at the 15 minute mark, go in the oven, give it a nice rotate. So I'm gonna throw these in the oven. And when we come back, we are gonna glaze these cakes. People are gonna love it. Look at these beauties. Sweet little bunt cupcake cuties. Mwah. I love them, they're gorgeous. I'm just gonna go in and glaze. Oh my gosh, look at this. This is powdered sugar and coffee. That's all it is. Mm, mm, mm. I'm trying to eat this right now. We have some candied karakara oranges. Just want to have a little bite of tang. Bop. Gorgeous. I mean, look at this. Are you, are you kidding? Do you see it? Are you seeing it? Delicious. I personally refuse to wait any longer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Look at that beauty. I am trying to smash this right now. It's fabulous. Pork going in. Shit. Oh my gosh. I've been waiting so long to take this bite. Oh my god. The coffee. I know you think you're just gonna taste dates, but you really taste coffee. It's so fluffy. It doesn't even need to be hot when you eat it because it's so moist. Mmm. Mmm. One of the most expensive cups of coffee in the world comes from Yemen and costs $16 a cup. And this premium roast importer is here to tell us why. In sort of preparation for this, I asked all my friends, like, of the coffee that you drink, do you know anything about where it comes from? And people are like, no, I have no idea. I just really upset that my coffee costs five bucks. We are disconnected where, where, our, where our products come from. And because of that disconnect, we don't know the realities, the labor reality, the political realities of how, our, how things come. For me, it's about transparency and traceability. It's funny me saying this, but I didn't like coffee like seven years ago. That's so recent ago. Yeah. <laughs> like, seven years? And I drank it and it was, it was, there was blueberries, there was honeysuckle, there was like this sweet, like lingering aftertaste. And I went to them, I'm like, what did you, what did you, what kind of a flavor did you put in the coffee? on those, this is just the way, it's, this is how coffee should be if you do it right. We buy this coffee directly from the community in Yerkachefe, Ethiopia, and, and we, we were able to pay them more money for better quality coffee. I loved it, you know, so I just started looking up the history of coffee, and I'm like, wow, there is a city in Yemen, a port called Mocha, and it's where coffee was first commercialized. These Sufi monks who were the first to, you know, really believe the, in the power of coffee, 
at that time, Yemen had a monopoly in coffee. It didn't really, it didn't want anyone to, to, to grow it, so they, they banned anyone from taking seeds out. Eventually, the Dutch, they were able to steal seven seeds. They stole these seeds out of Yemen and took it to one of the colonies in Indonesia on the island of Java. And then after that, coffee makes its way into Europe, and I really believe that's what really enlightened or started the Lyman period. Industrial Revolution, coffee houses became this place where writers, politicians, philosophers, like the American, French, and the Russian revolutions happened in coffee houses. Do you find Yemeni coffee anywhere? No, I tried to look, you know, and I went, I asked a bunch of, you know, um, seasoned coffee buyers from different companies and importers, and like, oh, Yemen coffee. Yeah, man, it's, it's hard to get, it's really expensive, it's, it's a lot of issues with the traceability. Why is it hard to get? Because it's in a country that's, you know, always through, has like, there's some kind of violence, there's a language barrier, it's in the, these mountains so far away from the world. So that was, I knew, okay, if I'm gonna do something in this, I, gotta, I have to go to Yemen and be like where it starts and be there. So you go to Yemen. And at that point, my family is just, they're like, okay, he's, it's not a phase anymore. He's actually doing this thing and they're very concerned. On March 25th, 2015, I woke up in the morning and I heard, it was like two in the morning, I heard these like loud explosions. Did you immediately think I need to leave now? By the morning, things got better. And I was like, okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta find my way out of this place now. Um, so I had planned a coffee tasting for Yemen coffee. And my idea was that these farmers are gonna work and produce and I'm gonna be able to sell their coffee there. So everything is riding on this. Like everything, all the work that you've done, the people that you've met, the farmers, it's like there's, the, the people are on the line. I ended up like going to the, the city. The ship was, didn't work out. I ended up being kidnapped there twice. Oh my God. And, um, and then through a series of angels and heroes and people in my life got me out. And we have this coffee event. It was super successful. And that was the most important moment because the work of the farmers, they put a lot of time into it and sweat and blood and to make that coffee taste that way. I mean, how refined that coffee tastes, how smooth from where it came from and how it's, 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 it's an amazing journey, right? It crosses like borders and, and, and political hardships and all these things to make it you know, to, our, to our, our cup. Every coffee literally is picked by hand Maybe 20 people have touched your coffee from farm to cup. How do you say to someone, please spend $16 on this coffee? This is arguably one of the most labor-intensive products we consume from farm to cup to us. And so when you decide to get to be cheap on something, someone pays a consequence to that. So what do you hope or wish that coffee could or would do for Yemen? I think that coffee is a really incredible opportunity for consumers to have a real impact. I think as consumers, we need to be conscious consumers to understand the food that goes into our stomach, the clothes we wear, how was that brought to us? Today has been all about coffee. And our coffee journey wouldn't be complete unless we topped it off with this. What better business to fall into than coffee, right? This historical thing that is also black, like hip hop, like us, and that also has historically been taken or stolen, like us, right, and like hip hop. It's almost like self-imposed reparations to be able to like provide for ourselves. Everything we need, we gonna get it right now. I grew up in Memphis and hip hop is a big part of our culture. We're taking all those skills and reclaiming them for a good that's been historically ours, but the narrative around it has been colonized much like the product itself. My name is Bartholomew Jones and I'm the owner and founder of Coffee Black. I'm a uh, educator, MC, and a coffee nerd. Coffee Black is our name because that's what we are. We're black people trying to get into coffee. We also want to encourage people to drink their coffee black um, and also to view that, to kind of see themselves as a beverage worth drinking black without any additives. The first Christmas of my marriage, my wife bought me an espresso machine and uh, that kind of set it off for me. Once my wife kind of gave me permission to spend money on coffee, it was a wrap after that. A trap house is essentially an abandoned house or at least a house that's not being primarily used as a residence that is available for illicit businesses to import products from overseas, uh, cook them up, and then weigh them out, bag them, and that's exactly what we do here, but our product is legal, right? And the, the product we're importing from overseas is coffee, it's not uh, cocaine. 
we're really like reclaiming this process and this aesthetic to like build our lives forward in a positive way. White boy Kenny, right? My man not black, but he's spicy white. <laughs> we roast out here at his spot and we call it the coffee trap house. Every country outside of like Ethiopia, Yemen, and Eritrea and Sudan got their coffee pretty much from Africa. If you think about it like a cipher, right? Ethiopia kicked the beat off, they kicked the first rhymes, and then immediately after that, Yemen started responding and joining in the freestyle, right? Yo, what up, bro? Hey, Man, I'm chilling, bro. How are you? When I talked to my brother Mokhtar, he was telling me like, yo, coffee was a way for me to kind of find my purpose and reconnect with something that's historical. The Yemeni people had to deal with a lot of the same issues that other African countries face, which is theft of their goods and discoveries. When we think about Africa, a lot of times people think it's monolithic, but black people are not a monolith. African people are not a monolith. Cupping is an industry technique, use it as a means to kind of introduce the idea that coffee can be good black at all. So part of what you have to do in, in a cupping is you have to aerate the tongue. You hold the spoon and then we call it the hood slurp, right? So when I first got into coffee, coffee was like, like obviously white, right? That was the perception, that was the narrative, that was the baristas, that was the whole game. I, I feel like there's a renaissance right now in coffee. In the African-American community, the X represented them putting that last name on hold until they could find a connection worth redeeming or reclaiming. And that's really what we're finding with coffee is that coffee's been missing from so many black communities, specifically in the African-American community for so long, that we gotta find that connection again.